turn together. Very nicely done. Okay? Everybody get it? Well, it's just, tr it's troopers cross over when they just have to remember that, that the, uh, the horses behind are going to turn at the same time as the, their, what used to be their partners. It's, it's, everybody does things at the same time. Okay, we're going to try it one more time. Troopers cross over. Yes, nicely done. That looked really good, ladies. Now see if you can get out of it as nicely as you got into it. <laughs> Very nice. So you'll all turn left at the same time. Yes, 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 yes. Very nicely done. Troopers cross over the long way. There you go. Now you're all going to turn at the same time. That was Lady Lanza going up to Lux. To Gentleman Lux. We hope to have a foal a year from now. Well, she's only going to be bred once and then go back to the vet. The vet's taking a very active role in all of this. What's that? It's seven minutes to four. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, I'd like to try this uh, this crossing over uh, at a gate. So, Columns Gate, and Juliet's in charge of the speed because she's at the front of the right file. All right. Keep gating. Okay. Troopers cross over at the gate. Now Miranda's in charge of the speed. Miranda's in charge of the speed going across. And then it's when we get over, Ruby will be in charge of the speed. Everyone ends up next, Paula next to Ruby. Get up there, Paula, next to Ruby. There you go. All right, you're in charge of the speed there, Ruby. Get along. Columns right down the center, left down the center. Columns left down the center. Stay in your columns. Files right and left to the rail. Turn and go to the rail. One horse behind the other. When you get there, you're gonna go towards the trailers. Okay, Ruby's in charge of the, of the uh, speed. Okay, now I want you to listen up here. Files right and left to the center. You should be coming nose to nose. 
come nose to nose. And then files halt. When you're nose to nose, you're going to do a files halt. All right. Troopers right. Uh, troopers right. You're, uh, that's it. You should be next to each other. We were going to try to do the pinwheel, but uh, one of our files got a little goofed up here. So let's come back here, ladies. Get next to these two, but facing in the opposite direction. You did. You did fine. You did that. You did it exactly. You, you followed the instructions. You just got your horses off a little bit. That's all. So Mickey should be next to uh, Smokey, but facing the, the uh, Osprey. Yeah. Yes. Okay, She's supposed to be. Why don't you take him all the way around, Ruby? Take him around. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Now, Butch, you get over next to him as close as he is, as you can. Let's get as close as you can. Just, you're fine, Ruby. Just stay where you are, but move Butch over. All right.
All right, welcome everybody to photography session number, officially number two. We have John with us over at home. Hello, John. Hello, how are you? <laughs> so we're going to start out with just kind of a little review. John's going to remind us of briefly what we went over last week and then what we are going to go into this week. So here's the first slide. You saw it last week, but we're going to review it today. Yeah, we're, we're breaking photography down into the buttons and the emotions. So on the button side, we split that into three things. Shutter speed, which we talked about last week. Aperture, which is what we're going to work on today. And ISO, which is uh, the next uh, session. Perfect. And then another little recap slide for everybody. Yeah, if you remember from last week, um, what do you use your shutter speed for, Danielle? Um, to either create motion blur or to uh, kind of have to freeze the moving object. Very good. You remember. <laughs> I've been thinking yeah, so, about a lot. Yeah, the, the shutter speed is fairly straightforward. Um, you can either blur subjects or freeze them in space. So that one went over pretty well. Um, ISO, which is the next lesson after this one, um, controls how sensitive the camera is to light, and it controls how grainy or how much texture there is in the photo. And today's session is on aperture, uh, which I think I misspelled in all my slides, but we'll look past that. <laughs> but the aperture will control uh, what's called your depth of field. Um, the depth of field is the, the linear distance in front of the lens that is actually in focus. So on this on this slide, uh, 35 millimeters will have this sort of dial. Uh, where you can get to your aperture settings. Um, there's also an aperture ring on the lens, which we'll look at in a minute. And on, on point-and-shoot cameras and cell phones, you'll have the scenes, but you won't have the big A, probably. Mm -hmm. the, a, the A uh, sets the aperture as the, the most the highest priority. And then down on the scenes, there's a couple of scenes that use a large aperture for a lot of depth of field. And that's the landscape mode and mm -hmm. the macro mode. Uh, do you have those uh, scenes on your camera, Daniel? Yes, I do. And I, for my aperture photos that I took, I did use the aperture priority setting. Perfect. Good job. Yeah. yeah. All right. You want to show us some of your photos yeah. and talk about them? Absolutely. Let me make sure I have the ones. All right. So here's the first one. I thought it showed a shallow depth of field the best out of all of the pictures I took. And I know it's not necessarily a row of something, but would you say this kind of shows aperture? It's, it's perfect. It's a, it's a great example. You have a shallow depth of field here, which which isolates the, the out-of-focus flowers in the background from the in-focus flower in the foreground. Mm -hmm. So that brings your brings your eye, brings your attention to the in focus part of the photograph. Right. Actually, it looks like a greeting card to me. That'd be a good Mother's Day card. No, that was like a block away from my house. I was on a walk and I was like, wow, that is beautiful and it would be perfect for my assignment pictures. Well, there you go. Um, Photography is everywhere you go. It really is. And then so for this photo, too, that um, I said it, like I say, in the picture at my lowest aperture setting, which is 4.5, and then for the smaller, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, the smaller the opening of the lens, you need to set the ISO to be more sensitive to let more light in. Is that right? Well, remember the three three um, parts of the triangle there. We've got the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture. Mm -hmm. So if you want more aperture, you can either take it from the ISO or you can take it from the shutter speed. Okay. Okay. So in aperture setting, it only allows you to play around with the ISO and the aperture, doesn't it? Um, that varies by camera. Yeah, I think so. Mine just had the ISO and the aperture setting. So I wonder, obviously, going into full manual mode would allow some more, um, maybe more 
little more challenging to get exactly what you want since you're playing with shutter speed and ISO. Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, you know, when you when you change one leg of the tripod, you have to adjust with the others in mm -hmm. some fashion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So here's yeah, my, my shallow depth of field picture. And then I have one with a little bit larger. So this is a little bit um kind of a smaller picture, but shows, you know, rather than yeah, just that first flower being in focus, it shows the whole whole garden of flowers and it was taken with the highest aperture setting my camera has, which is twenty that's about twenty two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good example of, of how to use a large depth of field so that you have everything in focus. Mm -hmm. um, aperture is probably the most confusing aspect of photography. It's the hardest one to get for everyone, I think, uh, because it's kind of backwards. The, the smallest mm -hmm. opening, the smallest opening mm -hmm. is the largest number, and the largest opening is the smallest number. Yeah, that I was reading up on it, and I that I'm going to be honest, that still confuses me. <laughs> But well, don't feel bad. It still confuses me, too. Because, <laughs> yeah, in my mind, when I think that I've set it at, you know, f.4.5, that means that the lens is smaller. But is that wrong? Um, the lens is the same size, but uh, the hole through the lens is bigger. Okay, and that itself is the aperture. Uh, right. I didn't hear all those words. Oh, sorry. So the... So the lens, the, the number is referring to how big the lens is open, but then the aperture is a totally different thing than the lens opening? No, nope, it's one and the same. Aperture okay. means hole, and so in the camera sense, aperture is the hole through the lens that allows light to pass through. Mm hmm So your camera, you said, starts at 4.5? Mm-hmm, yep. Okay. I remember last week, when we change shutter speed by one unit, we call it units of light. We refer to them as f-stops. Uh -huh. So if we if we lower our shutter speed by one one stop, um, it's the same. It works the same way with ISO and with aperture. If mm -hmm. you take your lens from f4 to f5.6, that hole is effectively half as large, and it's only letting in half as much light. Okay. It's not that, exactly yeah. half. It's like the square root of 1.2, but <laughs> one day I'll get that. Um, I'll move on to so these. This is another example. I just did a little side by side of uh, the one on the left, and with all of my pictures, I did with the shallow depth of field. I did my lowest, and then with the larger depth of field, I did my highest setting. So obviously, it'd be interesting to play around with kind of the mid scale of it with pictures, too. Yeah, and it, and then it also varies by lens, which we'll look at in a second here, too. Cool. So, yeah, yeah. Those are two good examples there of, of a shallow depth of field and a large depth of field. Yeah, my, my boyfriend wasn't too excited when he saw that I had his fly case and all of his flies <laughs> outside on the table. I had to do it before he got home from work, but he saw that I had moved it. <laughs> Tell him it's, it's all part of the job. Exactly. And then two more. So this was my, this is a picture I took um, like three weeks ago before I think I really understood my camera and aperture. I mean, even though I don't totally still. But um, I, I'm wishing that I would have gotten traced in the other picture too to show that he's in focus in that picture and then contrast it with the one on the right where he's out of focus. Well, working with models isn't always easy. Yeah. <laughs> but then I looked at it and I was like, oh, well, you can see, you know, the rafters are out of focus and the, the wall down there and, and most of the other halters are out of focus. And the ones mm -hmm. on the so if you pretend that the trace isn't in the right photo and then compare the two photos side by side, what happens when you look at a photograph is one thing that attracts your eye is contrast, which means focus. Mm -hmm. So your eye tends to want to go to the thing that's in focus and not right. go towards the things that are out of focus. Right. So, so by learning how to use your depth of field and your aperture, 
you can start to guide the viewer's eye around the photograph and make sure that they understand what you're trying to, to show and, and describe them in, in your picture. Okay. Yeah. So that's another good example. And here's another. Yeah, this one shows. I like how this one, I mean, you can almost see the point where where the focus set stops. Yeah, you can actually lay a ruler out and photograph it with a slight angle, and then you can actually measure. Oh, cool. That's a good idea. Because I didn't think of that. And then here's another <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, funny, because obviously, you know, the first one's not in focus. It says one's further down or in focus, but then the background is totally out of focus. I wonder what was going on with that, because I think I had it on the it same looks, thing. It looks like maybe your focus ring got turned a little bit. Mm-hmm. Focused a little further away than you were in the previous slide. Yeah. Yeah, but so... Yeah, and, and the fact that they're not perfectly in line, maybe, yeah, made the, the focus jump to something else. Oh, yeah. If you're using autofocus, it'll do that on you. Oh, yeah. Why have I... That is something that I've been doing is it's once been on autofocus. Do you mostly use manual focus on all your photos? I always use... Uh, well, 99% of the time I use auto or use manual focus. Yeah. And if you're using a, a shallow depth of field to kind of draw the, the person's, the viewer's eye to a specific part of the photograph, then you want to use manual focus to make sure that that's your focal point. Yeah. Gosh, I doesn't not, know. Yeah, because here I was kind of like leading in a little bit, and then I would see that what I wanted in focus wasn't in focus, and I'd lean out just a little bit, and I'd see it be in focus, and I'd, <laughs> then I'd snap it really quick to capture it. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot easier to just turn the autofocus off and <laughs> turn the ring on the lens. Oh, well, every session I have to learn something big, and that, yeah, there's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Uh and then I have these two side-by-side -side photos. That's another, yeah, I, I really like, and this, again, was a walk away from the house, and I was pretty excited once I got got to the house and put them on my computer and saw how, how nicely they contrasted and showed shallow and large depth of field. Mm -hmm. and I hope your neighbors don't mind you walking around their flower beds. I know. I actually did step about halfway into the one, the very first picture, and then realized, oh, I'm not going to get as comfortable as this one. <laughs> but getting too into the moment, I think. Yeah, well, that happens when you put a camera in front of yourself. Yep. Well, so that's... If, you put a, if you put a tape measure in these photos, it would be really easy to see where your focus begins and where it ends. You've got a lot of depth of field on the right and just a little bit of depth of field on the left. Yep. What looking picture? at them side, looking at them side by side, uh, on the left image, your eye has to go to the flower that's in focus. Your mm -hmm. eye just won't go anywhere else. On the yeah. next picture, when you look at that, your eye bounces back and forth between the two different flowers. Yeah, yeah, and it kind of almost leads your eye down the fence a little bit too. Mhm. Mm You've got um, converging lines, or the, the roof and the floor line, are drawing your eye to the right as well. Mhm. Mm We'll talk about that when we get to composition. Uh, what picture do you like better? Oh, I, I always far... like the shallow depth of field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know it's it's interesting how the same exact thing, but it can be so much more engaging um, the one on the left. Mm -hmm. Just with that change. Well, that's yeah, the, the, one... the easiest photo for someone to understand, for someone to figure out, is one that is simple. Mm -hmm. So when you have everything in focus, you have a complicated photograph, and your eye has to move around a lot to read it. When right. you have a, a photograph where only one thing is, your subject is the only thing in focus, it's a lot easier for your your brain to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, those are the last of my photos, so we'll jump up to the ones that you have of the different lenses. Is that right? I'm um, sure. There should be. Yeah. Is that the right for, first one? Yeah, we can start there. Okay. 
um, for people who haven't actually seen a 35 millimeter camera lens off the off the camera, inside of it there are overlapping blades that form the aperture. So this is a, a 24 millimeter lens looking through it. So starting okay. on the left, the largest number f 2.8 is or the smallest number is the largest opening in the lens. Huh. And then working towards the middle, F8 is about the middle of the, the stop range. So it's a uh -huh. medium opening. And then F22, where you have the most of the field, that's a tiny opening in the lens. So it's, it's barely letting any light through there at all. So you have to compensate either with ISO or with shutter speed. Wow, that's a great visual for making sense of what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. So that shows you how the opening changes in the lens. And the other part, the other part of this that people don't know is that when you're looking through your lens, no matter what what aperture number you have chosen, say mm -hmm. you've chosen f f22, when you're actually looking through the lens, you're looking at it through you're looking through it with the largest aperture, the f2.8 or f4 mm -hmm. on your lens. It only goes to f22 when you push the shutter button. Okay. And then, it, and then it opens right back up. Wow. So whatever the the smallest number is on your lens, that's how much light is coming through to your eye when you're looking through the camera. Okay. And the more light that comes through, the easier it is for you to focus or for your camera to autofocus. And mm -hmm. that's why if you take two lenses, say you have two 100-millimeter lenses, one is an f2.8 and one is an f4. The f4 lens is going to only let half as much light through, so it's going to be harder for you to focus and harder for your camera to focus. Uh -huh. And that's why the, the, the lenses that are you know, f2.8, the bright lenses, cost so much more than the other lenses. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, do you want me to hop to the next slide? Sure. All right, what's going on here? Just to show people, if you're using a, a cell phone or a point-and-shoot camera, you probably don't have either of these things, but this is a, how a 35 millimeter lens works. You've got the focus ring, which mm -hmm. most people are familiar with, and closer to the camera, you have an aperture ring, huh. which has the, the aperture numbers. Okay. And then in between, there are little colored tick marks. At least this is how Nikon does it, and how um, Canon does it. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the aperture numbers, you'll see that each one is a different color. Mm -hmm. And then those tick marks on in between the two rings correspond to those colors. So, okay. So, so if you look at, say, F22, it's kind of an orange color. Mm hmm so if you go up and find the two orange tick marks on there, it'll show you approximately on the lens where your, your depth of field begins and where it ends. Wow. So is that is the depth of field, the orange color, the one that the arrow is pointing at, or is it the one that's on the left, right below the F.22? There's two for each color. There's a pair for each okay. F.22. Okay. So there's an orange one on the left end and an orange one on the right end. Oh, I see. I see now. Okay. I wonder if my so, camera... Um, they've started... In recent years, they've been taking the depth of field guides off the lenses. Uh-huh. So nowadays, a lot of the newer 35-millimeter um, lenses no longer show this. Huh. I mean, it's kind of too bad because it's really helpful in some instances. Yeah, I mean that that is it makes things a lot more yeah understandable to have that visual and the, the color guides and everything. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the orange line on the left, it's pointing to about five feet. Mm -hmm. And then look at the orange line on the right; it's pointing to about a foot and a half, a foot and a quarter. Yeah. So that shows you what will be in focus with your focus ring turned to that position. Wow. 